Well, good evening. Thanks for coming back. You know, it occurs to me, if you didn't show up, it wouldn't be much point in me being here, would it? No, the purpose of public speaking is to speak to people from what God has said. And we're delighted that so many of you have been coming all this time. And we've come to the last lesson. And I look forward to sharing it with you. Her theme has been loving God and man. And it's just a bit of review. There is no more important subject than learning about loving God and loving man. We learn the skills of love that draw God even closer to us. And then the second lesson we dealt with loving man, the power of accepting one another. So important. Because we are fallible creatures. We make mistakes. We believe things that aren't so. And there has to be time and opportunity and teaching and encouragement to overcome the various things that we get wrong. But the process will only be aided when it's in an atmosphere of acceptance as a brother or a sister in Christ. The power of accepting one another. This power of accepting one another, we emphasized, love is accepting one another. Love is learned. Acceptance is learned. Accepting, accepting one another is learned by being accepted by God. You know, if God accepts me, and he does, and he accepts you, why on earth would we ever not accept another brother or sister? Now, we have to distinguish between that and accepting error or evil or sin. But be careful. We've all sinned and fall short. He continues to fall short of the glory of God. If there needs to be time again and opportunity and teaching to help us all to grow. And it needs to be done in that atmosphere of love, which is accepts one another. And then accepting one another for what purpose? That's this morning's lesson. Also, the value of serving one another. Keep that image of Jesus on his knees, washing the feet of the disciples, demonstrating to them what's important about our service to one another. And each of us have been given uh, different gifts. It was uh, such pleasure for me to sit under the tutelage of Richard as he taught us hymns, some of which I did not know. They were new. Well, God's given him that gift. He wants to use it to the glory of God. I know him well enough to say it without really uh, doubting its truthfulness. And in love for others to help us to grow, you see. It isn't showing out. It isn't demonstrating his prowess or his ability. It's serving, investing into the common good. All of our talents. Whoever wishes to become great among you, Jesus said, shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For, over, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. <coughs> The service of God is not intended for God's perfection, but for our own. We're perfecting ourselves, completing. This is God's way to put us on our knees in service in which we truly become great in the kingdom. Well, tonight... 
Now we get to the heavy lifting. You ready? You ready to think seriously about reaching the lost? No greater mission is found upon the earth than reaching the lost. And it involves every one of us in various and myriad ways, all using our talents and time and opportunity to think and pray and to reach out to the lost of this world. The imperative of reaching the lost. It needs to be done who understand the foremost commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's why we're reaching out to people because God deserves the glory and the praise of every creature. He deserves it. But also because we love them. My life has been so blessed in that God has used me to teach others the gospel. But others have done just as well, and they were not teachers as I am. They were helpers. They were arrangers. They were those who had me over for supper, and we would then sit and talk with others. Most of the people I've been able to teach were through the contacts of other people. Some that I, one in particular I'll mention at the end of our lesson tonight, but most have been through the work of others. It's a team. You know people I don't know. You can do things I cannot do. There are a few things I cannot, can do that you cannot do. That's just the gifts of God, and we need to invest them for the common good and be this team of showing and beaming forth the light of God's greatness into this dark world. The imperative of reaching the lost because we love man. We love God. We love his creatures. Man. Let's begin. The imperative of reaching the lost. I'm just going to take the key words in the title. Apparently when I was working this lesson up, I got lazy. And I just said, well, it's right there. We'll just take loving, and then we'll take lost, and then we'll take imperative, and then we'll take reaching. Isn't that creative? Because there's the motive. There's the reason. There's the motivation. This love. And there's the mission. The lost. And then there is the importance. That's why it's imperative. And then here is the effectiveness. The effectiveness. Reaching, reaching the lost. So let's begin. You ready? I hope to do this quickly. Ah, oh, promises, promises. The folks at home just groan when I say that. They know it's not going to happen. At any rate, let's go. I always intend well. Axis of evil. Silence. And often that's the way we are in the world. We don't see any evil to really correct or say anything about it. We don't hear anything that is, should not be there and attempt to do better. And we certainly don't speak evil. I'll just be silent. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right this day. Th this day is a day of good news, but we are kept, but we are keeping silent. I'm going to go back and set the context for that statement. 
2 Kings chapter 7. The text is about Samaria, the northern capital, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Elisha is the prophet. And Syria, or the Arameans, have come and encircled the city of Samaria, and they're going to starve it out. They're going to not let any food in, nothing goes in, nothing comes out. They've laid siege on that great city. They're going to starve the people to death. And then the scene shifts to four lepers who are at the gates. And of course, because they have leprosy, they're not welcome into the city there to associate with other Israelites. And they're starving too. And they begin to think, you know, here we are, and by the gate, that means the opening uh, to the city. And they begin to talk to one another and say, well, if we go into the city, we're going to die there of famine. We're going to die there of starvation. If we stay here, we're going to die of, of starvation. Why don't we go over to the camp of the enemy? What's the worst that can happen? They'll kill us. We're dying anyway. So let's go. These four lepers go over to the camp of the Arameans, the army. But the night before, God had caused a great sound that absolutely terrified. It was the sound of an army and chariots and everything. And the Arameans mistakenly thought that a great army was coming to get that the king of Israel had hired the Egyptians or others to come and to fortify his army and they were about to be destroyed and they in fear they absolutely fled the camp leaving everything behind and these four lepers starving lepers walk into this camp at twilight and it's absolutely deserted and they've left all the food all the gold, the silver, the clothes, everything behind. If you're one of the four, what are you thinking? Wow, we're saved. And they begin to gorge themselves and they take on the clothes and they accumulate the riches and even go and hide some of it. Oh, now we've fallen into it. And they just keep, you know, just... Uh, heaping this on themselves. And then it hits them. We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. But we are keeping silent. We got a whole city over there that's under siege and they think they're about to die. And the enemy has fled. The danger is gone. And the story then proceeds. They go back and spread the news. The, the, the king, he says it's a plot. It's a trick. But they send the company. They said, they said let's take some horses. They're going to die anyway. He said, take, you take, I think they said four horses. You take some, go over there and see if it's true. They do that and they come back and report. No, it is true, they're gone. And the city is saved. Are we, a, do we have a guilty silence? You ever felt guilty because you did not speak up? Maybe at work, or with a neighbor, or a family member. And you feel a little guilty about it, or maybe a lot. Let's begin to attack those feelings and replace them with the confidence to speak, to act, to inform. Because we have good news. 
Oh, but we've got to tell them to quit this and quit this and don't start this and this and they're not going to like it. They're going to get mad at us. Folks, you never know. It's good news. Jesus has come and died for our sins. He has provided for us in his kingdom to experience the plenty of spiritual blessings in him. We have good news. It's the gospel, the good news. And so, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. He needs to start right there. Set apart Christ as what? The boss, as Lord in your hearts. Always and obey his command to take the gospel to the world. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you. That means we got to get ready to answer any question that anybody brings up about the Bible. And we all get defeated immediately. That's not what it says. Let's further read it. Being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks. You to give an account for what? For the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Your hope of being with the Lord in heaven, of going to heaven. I don't see the hands of the people who have this hope in their heart. We got good news. Let's tell people about our hope. And biblical hope is not wishful thinking. Oh, I hope this will be. I hope in the judgment I this. I hope this. The biblical hope is confident desire. Our desire plus expectation. Not only desire it, but we expect it. Because of the work of Jesus Christ. People need to hear that. Our friends and neighbors need to know why we have this hope, why we anticipate and we're not fearful of Jesus coming back or the judgment. We got something to share with them. The account for the hope that is in you yet, but do it with gentleness and reverence. Folks, we're not any better than anybody else on this world. We just happen to know the good news. Somebody shared it with us and told us about their hope. And we're not talking about everybody becoming a Greek scholar, or a Hebrew scholar, or even a biblical scholar. We're talking about why you believe that you are saved. Why you believe that Jesus is died for your sins, and therefore you are forgiven. Why is that? Why were you baptized? Was every other kid in your group being baptized? You decide, well, I think I will be too. Or, you know, you got to be in your early teens. Well, it was just time. Well, if that's so, you need to rethink it. A decision was made based upon what you believed and what you began to hope. People need to hear that story. And let's learn to tell it. I recommend, we've done this where I preach, we've done it several times, where we just get in small groups and everybody goes around and talks about how they came to know Christ and what they understood and what they did to be converted to the Lord and became a Christian. In their own words. In their own time. Some are eloquent, some are not. But they're all genuine. From the heart. I recommend that to you. It's good practice, if you will, but even more, it's edifying. I've spent my life as I meet people and have the opportunity, Christians, I'll just ask, why did you become a Christian? Why? I love to hear those stories. I'm going to tell you a few tonight. I'm saving one of the best for last. I love to hear that. And I tell them my story. I was almost 14 years of age. 
I had heard gospel preaching all my life. My parents had made certain that I was taught the scriptures, not so much in the home, but in our local church. If the doors were open, we were there, sometimes late, but we were there. And I love to listen to preaching. Sister Clark, I enjoyed listening to A. Hugh Clark preach in our little local church there in Baytown. And I admired him. And I began to think, I was about 12 or 13. You know, I, I knew I had sinned. I had identified the sins. And it began to where I could not sleep well at night. And I talked to my parents and they said, well, John, you've got to make a decision about that. And so they left it up to me. And as I think I told you earlier in the time, it seems like we've been here a week, doesn't it? Well, maybe not to you, but... The, or maybe it seems two weeks to you. But anyway, it was the second row, first seat. I came that night. It was on a Sunday night, June the 30th, 1957. I was going to be baptized. And I stepped forward, confessed Christ. And, hey, Hugh Clark baptized me into Christ. I've never regretted that decision. I haven't always lived up to it, and I'm ashamed of that. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. But I've never regretted it. I've watched, I do not know how many young people make that same decision, teaching them, working with them. I don't know of a one that's regretted it. There may be. Some, even many at times, did not live up to it. But I know why. I wanted to be forgiven. I wanted to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. What's your story? Let's start telling them to one another. And if that works out and y'all decide to do that, I'd like to hear some of the stories myself. You can call me on the phone, I'll give you. I'm, I'm the last person in America still answers his phone. So apparently y'all know that story too. But I do. You know, I'm old school. I answer the phone. And I'd be delighted to hear it, your story as well. So, the motive love. Let's look at it. First of all, for God or Christ, a love for him is why we preach the teach and live the gospel and reach out to the lost. Paul writes, for the love of Christ controls us. He's either saying the love that Christ has for him or he has for Christ and maybe both. I'm reading it. His love for Christ. It controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Let Christ free you from the bondage to your self-desires. We don't have to give in to everything we want to do. We could choose to do the right thing and the noble thing and the glorious thing. But we're going to have to be set free by Christ's work from the bondage to selfishness and self-centeredness. It is a journey. Further, for man, a love for man, our fellow man is the reason that we reach out to the lost. Note this. And now I'm going to read the first 13 verses of, second, uh, of, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now I realize none of us are an apostle. And there will be some few things that Paul says 
that possibly only relate to him as his role in the apostle. And I realize that most of us are not preachers. You know, we got at least two of us here and maybe more. And some of what he says would relate more to what we do. But folks, I want us to read it with the motivation of the Apostle Paul to go to Thessalonica and to teach them the gospel. He relates this because I believe what he reveals about his heart applies to all of us. And it moves us. Let's begin. For you yourselves know he was being under criticism. After he had left, he was, there was opposition. And so he appeals to the Thessalonians. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, remember they were in prison in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. <coughs> opposition, even prison, didn't shut Paul up. Don't let it shut us up when we're opposed for speaking the truth and living the truth. Keep on. It'll be wonderful for us and wonderful for others. Paul says, we didn't stop. Further, for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. I didn't come in there telling stories and manipulation, trying to get you to do this or give me this or this and this. So much of religion is manipulation on oh, the part of preachers and those who are head of churches. Stories are replete of abuse. Paul said, not here, not me, not you. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Further, for we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. He wasn't there to get rich or get money from them. You know, that's one of the reasons so many people distrust religions. Because in their minds, they're always after money. And oftentimes they are. And the preachers flying around in helicopters and living in mansions and fancy this and this and this. It's a disgrace. No pretext for greed. We're not out there to abuse and use people. We're there to love them and to help. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we didn't do that. But we provided to be, but we proved to be, now I want you to note the tone and the metaphor he used to describe his actions and even more his attitude and his motivation. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother. Isn't that a beautiful picture? No, no more beautiful picture, at least in my opinion, of tenderness and care than a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Her body becomes a source of life for her child. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also, note it, our own lives. Because you had become very dear to us. Paul wasn't there to abuse them or use them, manipulate them. He was there because he loved them. He wanted to care for them. 
For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. One of the reasons that we need to work hard at being above board and honest and transparent and genuine is so as to not damage the opportunity to teach people the gospel. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. There's the motivation. There's the action. And it can, be, it can be followed by all of us in all of our various ways of talents and service. So what's the mission? There's the motive, love for God and for others. But what's the mission? It's to reach the lost. Sinners, you say, well, we're all sinners. Yeah, but there's some sinners that are lost. There's some sinners that have been forgiven and are saved. I'm looking at a crowd of that. Well, we want to focus our mission on those who are lost. Note, they have no love for God and man. The one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We've looked at that passage several times. That describes millions of people. That's our mission. To approach them with the good news about God and what he has done for them. Further, they, have, they don't believe in Christ. That describes probably even billions are, are really more to the point. That describes so many people. They don't believe in Christ. Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, that is the Christ, you will die in your sins. Our Muslim friends need to hear that. Our Jewish friends need to, need to understand that. Our atheist friends need to hear that. They need to know that this is what true religion is about. It's not about building buildings and building up a, a vast empire and, you know, all the stuff that goes on in American religion. It's about reaching the lost, those that don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's those who do not obey the gospel and have not obeyed the gospel. Further, when the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. That describes a myriad of people. And those who might even consider themselves and others consider them as foremost sinners, Christ's enemies. There was one who thought of himself that way. His name was Paul. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Everybody in the day of Saul of Tarsus would have said he is not a viable candidate to be a Christian. It will never work. He hates Christ. He's trying to kill it out. But he was changed. 
He describes himself as foremost of all. Later he says, because I persecuted Christians, I persecuted the cause. Yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Why would Paul say that? Is it really true or was it exaggerating? Just using it as a metaphor. I can't confidently say I got it nailed. But here's what I think. So now be aware. This is the gospel according to this John. I believe Paul, Saul of Tarsus, went as far as you can go and still come back. You can go so far in disbelief and disobedience that you will never repent. Only God knows. But Saul of Tarsus, I believe, serves as an example that even a man who was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was an imposter and devoted his life to killing Christians and stamping out this false religion, even he could repent. And he said he did it to show others they could repent too. Now I do believe that there is a line over which if you cross, you will never repent. I don't know where that line is, and I certainly am not the judge of any individual conscience or soul, but God knows, and I believe that's taught in the book of Hebrews. So that's my best attempt at explaining what Paul said. But what about the importance, the imperative? This is something we must do. Watch it. For others... Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. <coughs> For I delivered to you as of first importance, Paul writes, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. I wanted everybody of first importance to know that. Well, that's at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? And further in Romans, he writes, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Question mark. How will they believe in him they, in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Here it is, Jerry. Our jobs are saved. We're absolutely essential to the body of Christ. Brethren, he isn't talking about me or Jerry. He's talking about the apostles. Do you believe a person could pick up the Bible and read it and obey it and be saved? Yes or no? I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you believe that a person could pick up a copy of the scriptures, read it, understand it, and obey it and be saved? Yes or no? Yes. Those are the apostles. My job is to present accurately what the apostles taught. And that's what Jerry's job is too. And all others who preach the gospel. That's all of our responsibility to be as accurate as we can directing people to the ones, the preachers you have to hear. They're absolutely essential. How will they preach unless they are sent? Christ sent them into the world. We follow behind. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. 
There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I can remember using this verse and teaching my Muslim friend. We have a lot of Muslims in our community where I live, several mosques. I believe they have as much right as I do to believe what they believe as far in America, freedom of choice. And I would defend it. But I also defend my right and theirs to say, you're wrong about that, and here's why. Here's why. Further, you are the light of the world. Who's the you? Christians. We are the light, disciples of Christ. We are the light of the world. That's what he, he, that was our purpose. One of our purposes in coming to Christ, to be the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. He did not want us to be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. And praise you. Nope. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. We got a job to do. And we are perfectly able to do it. And then for ourselves, the importance of the imperative of reaching out with the gospel is important for us, not only for others, but for ourselves. Note this statement from Ezekiel. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have appointed you as a, you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you, shall, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out, to, uh, speak out to warn them, warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered yourself. Brethren, it may be painful to hear. But it's dangerous uh, for us to be silent. It's dangerous for ourselves. We're not warning as we are commanded to do. And lastly... It's effectiveness, reaching. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Remember the most often command of Jesus? Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness... You are blessed and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord, as boss in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Devote yourselves to prayer, he writes to the Colossians, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word. Brethren, let me encourage all of us. 
Let's start praying for open doors. Let's trust in the providence of God to put us in the place we need to be to walk through some of these open doors so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, he writes, for which I have also been in prison that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. I bet that shut them down. Therefore, those who had been scattered kept silent and abandoned the cause. Ooh, I misread it. Went about preaching the word. Yeah, we're there. Let me look what I said in the conclusion. I think I want to tell you about Michelle first. Approximately nine years ago, we asked Byron to come and build us another church building. And he graciously designed and built our meeting place in Sugar Land, Texas. In the court, I was initially not in favor of doing that. Too much money. We'll just stay right where we are. I didn't openly oppose it because there were many in our church whose wisdom, quite frankly, was deeper than mine. And they were the ones proposing it. They felt like we needed to move from our present location to a more a site that we felt like would be more advantageous to reaching people. I was wrong. It was the right move. Within the first five years, we grew about 60 people. People from the community, some Christians, many more who were not that we were able to teach. But in the course of building that building, there were many workers, local workers, that Byron had hired. And he hired an electrician, an electrical company of electricians to come. And there was a woman there, Michelle, who was an apprentice. She was from Central America. And she was coming, of course, to, and she was studying to be an electrician. She was the only female in the all-male team. It was my business and my purpose. I went to the course. I would go to the building site every day, and I tried to meet every worker. And I offered a Bible study to every worker to see who was willing. I remember the guy who came to to master key all the locks so that we'd have one key, a locksmith. He was down on his knees working on the front doors, and I was talking to him, and he wasn't looking up much, but I persisted, he kept talking. So I asked him, I said, would you be interested in a Bible study? He turned, he said, no! And I reacted just as you did. It tickled me. I don't know how many people have said, oh, yes, and never followed through. I bet you've had a ton too, Jerry. It was kind of refreshing to have one so certain, you know, that I could either move on or whatever. It was no. Michelle 
was the only one who said yes. And I said, well, when do you quit? And it was around 5 o'clock. They would quit every day. And I said, okay, I'll be here at 5, and we'll just sit out here in the open as others are packing up, and we'll just start reading the Scriptures together. And as we studied week after week, I began to know her. And I learned of her story, how she came to this country, what she had experienced in her home country. And there were many horrific details. She'd come for a better life. She was running from oppression. And I'll never forget as she began to understand, and then I could see her deciding, do I obey this or do I not? Do I know enough? Et cetera, et cetera. I made this statement to her. Before I tell you what I told her, I want you to think about how many of you oftentimes are can't sleep and you watch nighttime television after midnight? And all the ads that come on about this thing is going to help you, this thing. And sometimes I'm gullible and I just I say, okay, I'll give it a shot. I'll try this ointment here or this pill or this thing here. It's really going to make my life better. This guy, this woman, whatever, this celebrity just swears by it. It's going to really work. Brethren, I hadn't found one yet that worked. Now, maybe you have. I said, Michelle, if you will obey Christ and follow him as a disciple for the rest of your life, you will have the best life in this world that you could ever possibly have and you will guarantee it for life eternal. Can you make that promise to people? And she says, I want that life. And tears were in her eyes and tears were in my eyes as I thought, what other thing could I ever guarantee or promise a person that I know is right? This will help you. No reservation. The God of heaven is promised. And I got to be the guy to tell her there is a way. God let me be in that place to tell that precious girl. She obeyed the gospel. And then a cousin of hers obeyed the gospel. And then a sister of that cousin obeyed the gospel. And then the boyfriend of that sister obeyed the gospel. I'd love to tell you that she remained faithful. She hasn't so far. But she heard the gospel. And I got to tell her. I got to be the one to tell her. Will you be the one? Will you allow God to use you? It won't be of your doing. It won't be because you're so wonderful or this or that. It will be because of your love, you're going to get to tell them. Parents, you're going to get to raise your children 
with this gospel because it's the truth. And they could build their life on the truth. Evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Let's all be beggars. God, help us to find the famished. Help us to find those who are looking for bread. They're out there. And they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. But we are keeping silent. Let's don't do that anymore. Yes, we'll make mistakes. We'll be weak at times, but let's stay after it. We got good news. And my dear young friends, whom I love so much, you are my children. I'm going to be gone pretty soon. I'll turn this over to you. You carry the message. Thank you for allowing me to come and do what I love to do. Thank you. You've been so welcoming and warm and loving. May God bless you. And may God bless all of us with the joy of telling the good news. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to obey the gospel, let's stand. Let us sing.